have we got the product for you? <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to be that guy, a sham wow guy. <laughs> no, seriously. So, so Marcus and I have this product. We want you guys to think about it. This isn't an extreme offering. This is Marcus and GT. So we have this new Wi-Fi system, uh, access points, all this, you know, cloud, all the good fancy stuff. But so the access point is going to be three thousand dollars, which is that's to your cost, uh, which is about a five thousand dollar list. Let me check here our stats. <laughs> yeah, our cloud subscription is about a thousand dollars a year. Uh, you don't have to have any on-site appliances. We do offer support since you're paying a thousand dollars per AP per year, by the way. Uh, and so, uh, oh, also. Each access point needs two and a half gigabits per second. Uh, and we're going to dedicate one gigabit per second of that for upstream to the cloud. So we hope your WAN connection is pretty strong. But if you have all that, you've got the funding, hit us up. We're going to start this on Kickstarter any minute now. Yeah, and what really makes that, <laughs> what makes our product really, you know, wh why you should spend the money on it is because it's going to have the best AI that's known to man. Like we, you know, we're going to tear it up on AI. Right, artificial intelligence is where it's at. Right, that's that's the that's the thing it's going to get you. But but Mark, you know, we actually are we're somewhat kind of serious when we talk about this. We're not serious about the product, but we're serious about if you throw enough money and you could charge enough for it, you could actually create instantly within reason the best machine learning and artificial intelligence you know network system out there. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's the funny thing is every time, you know, someone starts talking about machine learning and AI and, and even just like the way that it's in a hype cycle right now is that everyone gets sort of narrowly focused when they look at products or when they look at technologies or solutions. It's like AI is where all the magic is, ha is happening. And so they kind of get focused on just the AI technology. But, you know, really one of the reasons that we wanted to introduce this video is to talk through some of those constraints. You know, GT talks about that that product that we're gonna that we're gonna build. We'll put the Kickstarter link in the description <laughs> below. <laughs> um, but you know that that all of those are sort of reflective of some constraint when you want to build an advanced you know solution. Um, so we just want to talk through that a little bit. Yeah, we need to, you know, if you have ever purchased access points or Wi-Fi systems, you'll realize our prices are ridiculous, right? It's untenable. So that's the, the funny part of this. But there's a reason that to do these things that, you know, we would have to charge more. This isn't, again, this isn't real. But you have to charge more because um, if you want great data out, you have to have lots of data in, or that's that would be the idea, right? We just throw lots of data at the problem, which means you need really great WAN bandwidth and that costs money. And you need really good processing, uh, both in the cloud and locally. So we got to put more processors and cool stuff in the boxes and then lots of storage. So all of that um, is kind of analogous. Think it to a, a, a self-driving car. So a self-driving car, like a Tesla, I'm a big, I love the cars. And that it needs to have, you know, we think of it, it just unlimited resources. But I guarantee there was a conversation that happened at Tesla. So if you don't know, Tesla cars, they get their updates over the air with cellular or Wi-Fi. Um, and, and so they need to learn somehow. So they need to take data that the car has collected, send that up to the cloud and vice versa. Well, they have limitations, right? There are limitations to what how much Tesla will pay for that cellular connection because that's actually something that's offered with the car. So that's just an example of some of the limitations that exist um, with this whole data pipeline, which is something we haven't introduced yet, but that's what we're talking about, this, this to getting data from collection to something good at the end. And GT uses that term data pipeline. And so, you know, if, if you've heard that term, but maybe don't quite understand what it is, a data pipeline is just the end-to-end -end process of managing data in a system starting with you know how you collect data through process and storage and display data so it's the whole end-to-end -end system for data-driven applications and so we want to actually just jump into some of those constraints and talk through it from the perspective of a data pipeline and you can kind of think of this pipeline concept i, I didn't make this up but it's it's for me been a really helpful thing to work out networking and application uh, data pipelines to understand and, and sort of wrap a framework around the way that data um, is collected and then moves through a system and an application. Is that a little bit like 
when you first said that to me, I thought OSI model, right? Yeah. It's, I mean, your pipeline goes left to right and OSI models bottom to top, but but it's sort of a structure, right? Of, of how we think of data or how we think of something, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the whole, the whole idea with like, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, we think about learning networking from, from scratch. Like you could learn all the exact same concepts and never learn the OSI model. So it's not like you need the OSI model in order to understand IP addressing or, you know, how MAC addresses work and, you know, layer two frame forwarding. Like you don't need the OSI model for that, but it's a really helpful framework to understand kind of how different functions are served at different layers um, within a stack. And it kind of helps you break down and isolate pieces of technology within a framework. So that's what the pipeline has done for me, which has really helped me understand it better. So what's the first step in the pipeline? So really the first one is, is all about getting your data. So it, I call it collection, but you know, it's just how we start, how we start with data. Where do we get it from? Um, and, and there's a lot of constraints at this step that come from, you know, the, the amount of data that you need for your end use case. So the volume of data that you're going to collect, um, the perspective of the collector, its ability to store and send and forward that data. Um, so there's a lot of interesting constraints that happen at the collection stage, just because this is where all the data starts in order to actually build a data driven application. And then once you collect it, you've got to move it somewhere. So there's the transportation aspect of this, but you know, Marcus is talking about collecting, but what do you transport? Because unless you charge a company like Extreme, charge a thousand dollars and you have unlimited WAN bandwidth, there has to be a decision made for what gets transported. So there mm -hmm. is this idea of transportation from uh, what, what gets moved, not only locally, maybe there's uh, a way that data is moved locally within your network, but then over that WAN connection, because it has to end up at the cloud somewhere at some point. So that's the next consideration is just moving that data. Yeah, and then even once it gets to the cloud, there's like this final step of transport is like message queuing, and which is basically how you distribute it throughout you know, the rest of the system or the application. But once that happens, then you have what become the fascinating steps of f first ETL, which is extract, transform, and load, which basically just means getting the data from somewhere, doing some manipulation of the data, and then loading it or storing it somewhere. But then, so there's ETL, but then also compute, which is where we perform our machine learning and AI. So this is where, as we sort of move forward in these videos, we'll really anchor in and spend a lot more time on machine learning and AI. But this ETL and compute stage is where there's so many decisions as it relates to how you model the data, how you train the data, whether your data actually represents the thing that you want it to represent and whether the model is accurate, how much you should rely on and trust the model. And so there's a lot of different nuances to that conversation as well and different constraints that happen at that layer. The next step in the pipeline is storage. When you think about data storage, we have to think of it locally on your networking devices and then in the cloud. What, what long-term or even short-term storage is there going to be? There's three V's of data science when it comes to storage, volume, velocity, and variety. The two that we're gonna talk about just quickly are volume, which is simple, which is how much data are we storing? And then variety is kind of interesting in what data are we sending up to the cloud, but also the variety of data accessibility. What We haven't talked about this yet too much in this whole series, but inside of a cloud system, there are many different types of databases. And the reason is because they have different abilities for storage and mostly how it retrieves and stores data. So that's how the variety comes in. So that's why you'll see differences in, um, you know, someone may use something, Elasticsearch and another thing will be used for this. And it's not because one is better than the other, it's because they're optimized for different things. And then even after it's stored, then you have the next, the next process of sort of retrieving data, which can be, you know, back-end systems, or it can also be, you know, through APIs. And so that introduces a whole nother constraint to anything that's going to be, you know, any solution that you want to build on top of some data, you know, is the ability to, 
get that data both from one system within, or, or you could call it a service within an application to another service within the application, back end or front end or whatever, but then also into third party systems. And that has its own constraints, especially as you think about, you know, getting data into the cloud is one thing, but then taking data out of the cloud and sending it to other places, there's an additional cost. And, and when I say cost, it's not just a financial cost, but it's also, a time cost, an operational cost, a development cost, you know, th there's all these different types of costs, you know, that have to be factored in here. And then what do you do with that data, right? We've gotten to the point where now we have to talk about an output. Now that output can be either in an action. An example action may be, we've learned a lot about your RF environment, your radio environment, now change channels accordingly. That's an action mm -hmm. that a system can do. Or the other is, I've learned a lot being that the, maybe the system has learned a lot, I'm gonna display some very useful information to my uh, network administrators. Yeah, well, and that, and that action component is another, I mean, it's, it becomes an interesting layer of the conversation because when you talk about ML, I think there's this sort of assumption that it's like, it's like binary, like it's right or wrong, but it's usually ML is statistical, which which means like there's some probability that it's gonna do the right thing and some probability that it's gonna do the wrong thing. And so when you start talking about actions and automations by systems, like that makes for an interesting conversation is like, if we have 95% confidence in this action, would you like us to take it? And like that raises all of its own questions and, and issues. But then there's the visualization stage, which is still, in my mind, the most underrated part of data pipelines, because that's where most of our value is found in the data today. And that's how we translate everything that was stored and processed into, you know, user value, understanding, you know, how many neighbors are on a channel, whether or not your, you know, AP has enough capacity, whether there's RF, RF interference of different types, whether clients are connecting properly and in which locations, looking at a map and finding out where there's problems or not problems. You know, all, I mean, those are just, you know, simple examples, but that's sort of visualization in a nutshell, but um, it's visualization is super subjective and super creative also in terms of how do we take data and present it in a way that solves problems. Yeah, we, we talked about the Tesla earlier. And when we think self-driving, if you really start diving into that a little bit, it's all about actions and visualization. Uh, a buddy of mine has a a Tesla and as you're driving, you can actually see it showing you stop signs and people and cones. But then think yeah. about something, Marcus, we've talked about before called the trolley problem. Yeah. Uh, you know, which is basically, it's a conceptual psychological thing that, uh, let's just take a, a real a, a example that can happen to a, a car. You have a bus coming one direction and you have a kid that's jumping out in the road, grabbing a ball. What does the AI do? That's the output. And there's a lot of discussion about that. That's one of the bigger issues with self-driving. But just think more in the networking space, it's about output. What is that output? Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna continue down this path. We're gonna break down each one of these things that Marcus and I have talked about. We're gonna break them down in other videos. Uh, hopefully you found this interesting. I know this is, this is very fun. I've enjoyed this. Uh, Marcus, you've been, you've been great. I appreciate the education as always. Yeah, man, it's always been fun. Appreciate you. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, everybody.